So good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and an honor to address you on this important matter. Um, I, uh, as Nicola said, I work with the International Commission of Jurists. Uh, it's a, a non-governmental uh, organization, an international organization composed of uh, jurists, judges, lawyers, and uh, law professors. And uh, our objective, our mission is to promote uh, international human rights uh, law, uh, um, or human rights more generally, through uh, the mechanisms of the rule of law. Uh, we are uh, headquartered in Geneva, but we have regional offices as well. So just for those who don't know the ICJ, that's uh, what the ICJ stands for. It's not only International Court of Justice, it's International Commission <laughs> of Jurists as well. Um, um, so um, let me first, um, I think congratulations are in order, definitely. I think you have done a, an excellent work on this re research uh, project uh, for all those who are involved, uh, uh, the Globernance, uh, is that the name, Institute, um, and all the uh, other researchers and uh, university, uh, um, and other groups that were involved into this project. I, I, I should uh, express my congratulations on uh, and gratitude for this uh, interesting, very relevant uh, uh, set of results and recommendations. I think they will be very, uh, very much uh, appreciated and, uh, uh, and also uh, paid attention to in, in the context of global debates uh, uh, on this uh, issue in particular. Um, uh, before I, I go to discuss uh, the questions or the, the, the different uh, possible avenues or different steps for the future, uh, I would like to highlight as well uh, um, a few of your recommendations that I see particularly interesting and relevant and pertinent and sometimes also ambitious in certain respects um, uh, in, the, in two areas. Uh, in the area of jurisdiction and expansion of jurisdiction and in the area of non-judicial uh, project of uh, company-based uh, grievance mechanisms. So in the first place in jurisdiction you highlight uh, or recommend the extension of European courts uh, jurisdiction over the subsidiaries of European-based uh, uh, domicile businesses in claims that are connected to a claim against the European company. The, the, another recommendation uh, focuses on the expansion of the jurisdiction to cases uh, concerning uh, not necessarily uh, domicile companies in Europe, but uh, or, or other companies when there is no other uh, forum or tribunal uh, that will guarantee uh, fair trial, but uh, at the same time uh, the, the claims are sufficiently connected uh, uh, or there is sufficient close connection with uh, a European state. Uh, I see these two uh, uh, recommendations particularly interesting and relevant. They correlate with some other recommendations that we were, dis we were discussing in other forums uh, until last year I was participating in, in a working group in the Council of Europe um, and that uh, issue finally at the beginning of this year a set of recommendations, recommendation 2016-3 on filling the gaps of the implementation of the guiding principles in Council of Europe. Council of Europe in particular is, uh, is, is relevant because uh, it covers or so the membership of the Council of Europe is larger than the European Union, including Russia and several um, Eastern European or CIS countries. Um, the International Law Associations, SOFIA guidelines, also uh, are also quite pretty much in tune with these recommendations that you are included in your uh, in your uh, final uh, report on the research. Uh, I would submit, nevertheless, the, that. Uh, there is a need to include uh, more discussion and a clearer recommendation about the question of uh, um, 
companies that carry out substantive business operations in European uh, countries. And I, I would suggest that this uh, category of substantive uh, business operations uh, should be understood or covered by uh, the sufficiently close connection. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it would suffice that uh, the company, whether it is Asian, uh, Chinese, or Indian, or Brazilian, uh, carries substantive business operations here, like selling, or buying, or having deposits, etc., or, 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 uh, or holding certain investments, not necessarily having subsidiaries here, but uh, just doing businesses, will be uh, consider as a sufficient close connection for this purpose, the purpose of your recommendations. Normally, substantive uh, business operations or presence in the market is a, is a legal category already considered well, in the U.S. for issues of jurisdiction, uh, um, in the United States, in, in California in particular, uh, but uh, also uh, in the context of um, by, uh, investments agreements, bilateral investment agreements. Uh, uh, concluded by the European Union. For instance, the EU-Singapore um, um, Bilateral Investment Treaty uh, considers investors uh, of each country or, 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 or grants a category of protection of investors to, to, co uh, to investors of, of one of the two countries that carry substantive business operations in the territory of their country without being domiciled in that country. Um, in relation to uh, operational grievance mechanisms, uh, your recommendations are very pertinent and, and here uh, quite ambitious, I, I would say, but uh, nevertheless relevant. Uh, you recommend further research on the experience of individuals and communities who have used grievance mechanisms and on the effectiveness of such mechanisms uh, uh, and assess whether they lead to fair remediation. That's a very good one very point uh, to the point recommendation. The UN system needs to develop more specific guidance, that's quite ambitious, for the implementation of the UN GP uh, to ensure effective and rights-based mechanisms. And the EU needs to provide clear gu guidance as well for in the EU and, and, and the national action plans. And company needs to provide more information. The area of uh, operational uh, grievance mechanisms is, is particularly uh, opaque for me uh, and for us uh, in my organization. We have been researching for, for a while uh, um, uh, how these companies, how these uh, mechanisms operate. And uh, what we have learned is that there is very little information about that. And uh, companies that claim that they are uh, putting in place uh, their uh, um, mechanisms, the grievance mechanisms, in fact, they don't communicate. And, uh, and the, the, com the communities that are, uh, believe in the surroundings of the company operations uh, themselves, they n know very little about the, 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 the grievance mechanism. Even if the company claims that they have uh, solved uh, hundreds of cases uh, every year, there's a contradiction of claims there. There is uh, uh, little information, even less transparency and reliability in the operation of these grievance mechanisms. Uh, there is also a, a fair degree of uh, that this, some of these mechanisms, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, inadvertently and uh, involuntarily, uh, lead to confrontation inside the communities because some part of the, of the, of the members of the community uh, uh, want to deal with the, co with the company and eventually present the claims to the grievance mechanisms and obtain uh, some sort of relief from the company no, accepting overall and at the end of the day the presence and the operations of the company in their community. Other parts of the community are opposed wholesale to the presence of the company as such. And they don't want to deal and even use any mechanism that the company has put in place. So, uh, uh, and then uh, the grievance mechanisms have been unable, or the company strategies have been unable really to deal with this issue of conflict and confrontation inside the community, and there are indications that, that uh, actually uh, the, the, those confrontations or conflicts are being uh, uh, encouraged sometimes by company officials. So, 
Uh, and then finally, as you pointed in your research, in this part it is, it is in your research, that the uh, uh, grievance mechanisms are used many times as, a, as part of the company legal strategy to shield itself against legal liability by using uh, you know, legal waivers and other mechanisms uh, that finally leave uh, the victim uh, worse off than at the beginning. Uh, those are the problems in the operations so, uh, from the, the research we have carried out. And uh, um, now, the way forward, let me start first with uh, this uh, issue of grievance mechanisms. Uh, at the ICJ, uh, in, uh, in coordination with the different other organizations, uh, hopefully they, uh, we have been discussing also with the International Bar Association, Human Rights Institute, and, and the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, we will uh, establish a panel of experts uh, towards the end of this year uh, to discuss and research and produce a report and prepare guidance exactly on what you are recommending here <laughs> on grievance mechanisms, company-based grievance mechanisms. As it, so this, that report with additional guidance should be released within one or two years. That includes research uh, and discussions, consultations, and site visits. You know? a number of four site visits to, to see on the place what's happening with the local communities and the cases that the companies claim they have been dealing with uh, in a satisfactory manner. Um, I would say also, apart from that, that the, these recommendations that you have uh, in your final report are, uh, will be paid attention, very, uh, very serious and very uh, um, responsible attention in the global debates uh, in relation to uh, standard setting and, uh, and ways to increase uh, or improve uh, access to remedies at the United Nations level. We periodically in Geneva, in the Human Rights Council, in the different human rights bodies, we discuss these issues and increasingly the committees, the different committees, the Committee on Economic Social Rights, the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on the Rights of the Child are in the United Nations are looking at these issues and the impact of companies, of business corporations and the and the protection of uh, the, the human rights. And they are issuing uh, documents, recommendations, comments, uh, um, etc. I think uh, um, several of these uh, um, recommendations will find their way into these discussions. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful again that uh, you gave me very good material to work with in my own work. Now, what could possibly happen? What I said is what is going to happen just now. What are we going to do? Now, what could possibly happen in, in the future? Many of these recommendations are mainly addressed to European organs or European institutions, and I think uh, EU institutions will uh, probably uh, take them very seriously and consider them very seriously, especially uh, in view that the that these uh, recommendations correspond in, in most part with others uh, that, were being, that have been uh, issued by other bodies such as the Council of Europe uh, and others. Um, so they would be really unwise that they, they, they were uh, neglected uh, and not considered. I think uh, early in this morning we also heard that the European Parliament is also working on a report and a resolution in which many of these issues have been discussed and uh, I bet uh, there will be some reflection of these recommendations into, into that report in, in its final shape. Um, there are two ways the European Union can go, I think, in terms of uh, putting in, into practice some of these recommendations. Uh, one is the unilateral um, avenue, and the other one is the collective one. The unilateral uh, action is, uh, is challenging, but it's possible. And it's sometimes it's preferable, because uh, if we're going to wait the rest of the, the world to act, and they probably will never act, never take action. I think if the EU leads on human rights and leads on business and human rights, probably there are very good arguments for European institutions to take the lead on also take, adopting measures in relation to uh, removing barriers of access to justice. But uh, 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 despite that the European Union is a big player in global affairs and uh, therefore can influence what uh, other regions and countries in the world do, 
uh, is nevertheless is not the, the determinant actor in today's world. And uh, there are other regions and there are other actors that are also matter, that also matter. So um, collective action is necessary. I think that collective action is uh, probably has to go through the UN. In the United Nations, uh, we have also two avenues in parallel. That one is that there is an ongoing process towards a legally binding instrument, a treaty, a convention on business and human rights. And uh, at the end of October, uh, there will be the second session for that intergovernmental working group. And obviously, several of these issues will be also discussed in that context. And that might be the opportunity also for the EU and other European actors to advocate for reforms at the global level in a collective way. Um, there is, a, um, at the moment, the European Union has been uh, staying away from that working group. It's just the second year, so it's perhaps too early. But the point is that they are being, uh, looking at the process from outside. Um, it might be time, maybe uh, soon, to, to, to stay engaging more actively. The second avenue is the, what is the follow-up to the implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights through the Working Group on Business and Human Rights. The Working Group on Business and Human Rights is this group of five experts that were appointed to promote the implementation of the guiding principles. They are UN experts. And they, they are the ones who organize the Forum on Business and Human Rights that happens every November of the year. And in November, I presume, this, uh, results will also be, be brought to Geneva and to be presented to the, to the wider uh, world there. Um, but, uh, of course, presentation and discussion is not enough. The, the presentation and discussion doesn't apply recommendations, doesn't operationalize recommendations. So we need action. You know, by EU or, or by the working group or by uh, countries uh, in different parts of the world. So that goes and that necessitates uh, some sort of decision, policy decision, by the Human Rights Council or by the working group or by uh, uh, other actors uh, um, uh, that um, have mandate on this issue and other special rapporteurs, other UN bodies. So I think, uh, I think we should point towards that. And uh, I think uh, the, the role of global uh, civil society is, uh, is crucial for that and, and that to achieve those, those results. I think there is uh, enough material here for many of us to work. Uh, I take the point, of course, that, that we need, there, there is a need for further research in certain areas. Uh, I think uh, the discussion this morning revealed that uh, the discussion about the applicable law no, especially in conflicts of jurisdiction, or in, 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 once you extend the jurisdiction of your courts, which law, substantive law, will apply, and the procedural hurdles that uh, appear in, in this context are uh, very important, very relevant. So it needs more, more research, probably, at the, a wider uh, level than just the European Union, most probably. But uh, 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 I think we, what we have now is, uh, is uh, also enough now to, 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 to get started. I think so this, uh, this is also a call for action uh, for with which I want to finish my, my intervention. So I thank you again and congratulate you, Nicola, on the results. Thank you. So now it's my turn to thank you uh, for inviting me and for guiding us in the panel and for all the f interesting results that uh, your research has delivered. So much appreciated. Uh, so I'm here from the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights and I'll, I'll explain a little bit what we do uh, and I'll, I'll try to, uh, in the process of explaining how we work with business human rights, I'll, I'll explain some of the related work we, we do. Uh, and. Uh, uh, towards the end of the day, it's, it's of course interesting to reflect a little bit on, on what one could say. Uh, there would be two avenues. One could say that everything has been said and I had planned already to say it, uh, so I don't have to say it. So that would be one way of, of uh, escaping. Uh, or another way would be to say that uh, 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 there have been uh, all, the, all the ideas that have been raised is something that I, 
I had on my on my list, and I will not deal with it. But there would be a couple of, of uh, strategies of how to how to deal with what has been said. Uh, the agency of uh, the fundamental rights agency, uh, we often call it FRA. Uh, it's based in Vienna. A good hundred staff. Uh, we've been there for nine years, uh, and uh, we advise the EU institutions and the member states on things that relates to fundamental rights within the European Union. So I'll come back a little bit to this within the European Union because, of course, some of the issues that we discuss here today are not related to, to inside of the European Union. So we'll have to be, be a bit uh, creative in, in how, we, how we work with these issues. Uh, we've dealt with uh, a related issue. We issued a report from uh, in August uh, last year dealing with freedom to conduct a business. So one of the uh, articles, one of the provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, Article 16, uh, how to remove, uh, if you will, red tape for businesses or make, at least make sure that there is a, a good balance between uh, obligations to the society and, and uh, removing, as I said, uh, obstacles for businesses. We've also dealt with the uh, uh, severe forms of labor exploitation, and, and Julia here has been deeply involved in that together with us. Uh, and, and in that context, we've of course also touched a little bit on business and human rights related issue. A few weeks ago, we issued a, a handbook on access to justice, uh, bringing together Council of Europe law and, and the European Union law, and, and that's something I must, uh, I must recommend. So on our website, you can download this or order paper copies, and we'll soon have them in all 20, what is it? for EU languages uh, online and, and in print. Uh, and in that handbook, we have uh, nothing explicitly on business and human rights, but we have uh, on, on remedies in general that they have to be accessible, about uh, the, uh, providing re redress uh, in, a, in an efficient way and in a, uh, in a, a coherent way, uh, or something that offers a reasonable prospect of, of success. In the past, we've also dealt with access to justice in general uh, in relation to human rights, in, uh, dealing with discrimination, dealing with data protection, asylum proce procedures, uh, dealing with issues like length of proceedings, costs, uh, burden of proof, where to turn, etc. And I wanted to exemplify with, with one, uh, with one uh, project uh, in, in this area. Uh, we've also, we also do some of these surveys, large-scale surveys, uh, uh, sometimes involving several tens of thousands of interviewees, face-to-face -face interviewees or interviews uh, on violence against women, on, on my, my, uh, minorities and uh, immigrants, on Roma, LGBTI persons, uh, etc. And one thing that we see from these uh, surveys or that the surveys confirm is, is the, the problem of reported cases or the cases that actually gets to be dealt with. And, and this attrition triangle, if you will, if you, if you imagine the, all the incidents up here and then the actual solved cases and that, uh, that uh, as it's called, attrition uh, process uh, from, reported, from happening to reported, to reported taken seriously, to reported taken seriously, uh, acted on uh, in a sufficient way, uh, very, very few cases are, are actually uh, dealt with and this is uh, across, across the areas and, and of course relevant for business and human rights as well. If I just uh, take one of these uh, and, and become a bit more concrete on uh, in, in one, one of the surveys we did in relation to minorities, uh, more than 70% of the interviews did not report uh, human rights uh, violations. Over a third of all the victims did not report, report because they didn't know where to turn. So more than a third didn't know where to turn. Uh, 80% of all could not think of a single organization where they could turn. Uh, and when we gave them, in this case, the name of equality bodies, or so national equality bodies uh, in the member states where we interviewed them, 60% uh, had never heard of them. And of course, that's a, an awareness problem that is, is uh, again, r related to business and human rights and, and many other areas. So those were some of the uh, business and human rights related issues that we've dealt with. Uh, so freedom to conduct the business, severe forms of labor exploitation, access to justice uh, more generally. Uh, but we also follow the, the, the area of business human rights uh, in some ways. Uh, the, the debate, the academic debate, uh, attending a conference here and there, organizing a small event here and there. And we had a, a nice uh, get together with some hundreds of people in end of June in Vienna, uh, called the Fundamental Rights Forum, where we brought together uh, on, on various topics uh, ranging from migration to digital age, but also businesses, where we didn't 
only di discussed business human rights specifically, but businesses and human rights uh, was one of the one of the issues. But coming then to to uh, what I really wanted to say, so that was the propaganda warm up, uh, if you will. Uh, in uh, at the end of end of June, the Council con Council of the European Union adopted conclusions where they uh, asked for a number of called for a number of actions in the in the European Union, and one of them was addressed to to the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, where they asked us, and I will have to quote, uh, where they asked us to adopt an opinion, and I'll come back to what that means in our context, possible avenues to lower barriers for access to remedy at the EU level, taking into account existing EU legal instruments and competences at EU and member states level. So this was uh, done under the Dutch presidency, obviously, the, the good Dutch presidency. Uh, not to distinguish it from the surely as uh, equally good uh, Slovakian presidency that is ongoing, uh, but this, this was a request to us, uh, and typically we get these requests uh, with some uh, a handful uh, at the most every year from one of the three EU institutions, uh, and uh, the council being one of the more rare requestors. Typically it's the parliament, uh, but on occasion also the, the commission. And in the past, we've dealt with issues that are typically related to the legislative process, so on the European Public Prosecutor's Office, or on, uh, or on uh, confiscation of proceeds of crime, on the racism uh, framework decision, on uh, uh, the European investigation order, uh, those kinds of issues uh, where the Parliament uh, or uh, the Commission or the Council has, has, has asked us. And here, then, we have an issue that is not connected uh, uh, which is a bit, a bit rarer to a particular legislative process, but a broader field, if you will, where, where there's less clarity on, on uh, what, the, what the obligations actually are. We have a, a tradition in these opinions to, to which are advisory uh, in nature to, to base our, our findings on what the international law, international human rights law, European human rights law standards are and what, what should be done. Here it's, of course, uh, less exact what we can offer. So we are envisaging at least to, in, in some weeks' time to have something where we will inevitably have to be fairly vague uh, uh, and, and say what the EU and the member states could, could do. It's of course a complex area in terms of legislation, in terms of shared competence, in terms of uh, the mandate of the agency that I alluded to in the beginning. And uh, for these reasons, but, but that's typically what we also, what we always do is to consult uh, well and widely uh, with uh, key stakeholders, civil society, governments, uh, just to understand the issues to the best of our ability, to see what is out there already, of course, learn from what uh, research and, and other advice has been provided. And for that reason, I'm very, very grateful and happy to have been here today. Uh, and, and also, I was in Amsterdam at your previous event, picking up a lot of good ideas. So. If I have my way in the end with the opinion, there might be uh, things, there will be things that, that you recognize. And maybe that's a, uh, and I'll, I'll conclude with that, but it, it's of course, uh, the agency has a particular position. We're an EU agency, an EU body. We can advise the EU institutions. Again, only advice, it's not binding. Uh, but we have to think about what is our added value. So not just restating all the other suggestions that are out there, but uh, we have to, to do uh, something more specific that the agency, uh, that, that, that makes it useful that the agency proposes. And I, I think you can help me with that. And I have some more consultations after this conference is over with, with some of you. Uh, so, what could we possibly include? Uh, I am the lead uh, at the agency on, on, uh, on drafting the opinion, but I, I do that together with a number of colleagues, and uh, surprisingly, maybe, maybe not, we have uh, bosses that also have a say. Uh, and uh, so what I say here is inevitably uh, my views, uh, and they might change. I might change my views, or I might be outvoted. But, uh, but here are some of the ideas that I think uh, could be useful, and, and some of them I already discussed with, with some of you. And, and as I said before, you will recognize uh, some ideas here. Uh, if, we, if I take a, a handful of examples, maybe, on non-judicial mechanisms, uh, I think there, something we could suggest is some kind of a minimum standard, some kind of a checklist or guidance on what would make sense to have for the European Union. 
in order to make access to justice or, or a remedy genuine and real. Uh, maybe that could be something uh, e-justice related uh, where the European Union has been active in the past. Maybe it could relate to the single, single digital market or, or cross-border context of the EU, but maybe we could suggest uh, criteria for independence, for uh, uh, anony on, on an anonymity, is that the word? Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean, at least. Um, on judicial mechanism, uh, Lisbeth had a nice idea uh, with expanding the, the, the mandate from environment, and that's, of course, something we could uh, think about. In terms of incentives, you have dealt with that in, in, your, uh, in your report as well. Uh, towards the end, I believe, uh, why the European Union should do this, and that's something maybe we also can dwell on, uh, role model, but maybe also <laughs> Uh, the competitive advantage that, that uh, these kinds of improvements on, on a remedy would have, but also, of course, uh, for the credibility of the European Union as a whole, and maybe uh, for the businesses uh, uh, within, the, within the constituency, if you will, uh, with, the, with the citizens or the people of the European Union, that we, that we have uh, faith and credibility in the businesses that are, are based in or operate from the European Union. We could probably say a lot of things about the national action plans and encourage that to be taken further with details uh, and, uh, and uh, again building in incentives on adopting the national action plans and building in incentives on actually making the, the action plans uh, actionable, uh, leaving the plan uh, stage. We could probably say something about the clarity of EU law, uh, something that has been raised also here today, uh, encouraging uniformity uh, and, and ensuring that standards are met, uh, looking at or suggesting monitoring but also support. Uh, and, and something like the, the Office of the High Commissioner suggests in their, uh, in their uh, was it May this year in their report, uh, regular reviews to make sure that the, rev uh, the remedies are effective. Uh, so. Uh, not only uh, having a plan, but also a practical review of has it been used, uh, uh, how has it been used, has it had a, a reasonable chance of, of success. And maybe, and maybe these kinds of, of guidance, these kinds of uh, comparative studies that this would entail would, would also uh, bring a comparative uh, advantage for the European Union in the sense of uniformity, that there would be a, a credible uh, minimum standard for the, for the European Union. And maybe uh, coming towards the end here, uh, maybe uh, children and, and discrimination is something we could look at in, in more detail uh, for, for obvious reasons maybe, but, but uh, in particular the EU competence uh, would be stronger here and maybe we can, we can argue more forcefully in those areas. And if you have a, a remedy for children, uh, I guess others could use it too, uh, unless it's very strange. Uh, finally then maybe, Awareness is, of course, important, and I think there's something we can, we can say a, a lot about as well that, uh, that previous speakers have, have uh, alluded to, uh, the last one not the least, saying that it has to, be, uh, has to be known, it has to be accessible, and you have to really know that these, that these complaints mechanisms do exist. So I'd like to conclude here uh, by, by simply saying that uh, I've appreciated uh, listening to the findings from the research and related uh, presentations today. And if any of you have uh, particular ideas for us to ponder on, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, added value for the agency, where the agency could suggest something that is not just a, a suggestion that anyone could make, but a sort of an internal EU suggestion from an independent advisory expert body, what we could uh, spend our energy on rather than suggesting everything. Uh, any, any ideas along those lines would be much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you for holding out so long, first of all. 
Um, my name is Lucas Rorda. I'm from the University of Utrecht. Also work with the Utrecht Center for Accountability and Liability Law. Um, before I start, I'll, I'll just say two things beforehand. First of all, um, those of you who have an older program of today might notice my name was not on the list before. I've been sort of scooped in uh, at a very late moment because another speaker had to cancel personal problems, shit like that happens, which means that I haven't had time to completely adjust my presentation to the other distinguished speaker. So if I'm, I might be slightly repetitive every now and then, I'll try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, a second thing is that, as you notice, my speaking pace is pretty fast, and I know not all of you are native speakers or very, um, work a lot in, in the English language. So if I'm unclear on anything, please ask, raise your hand. Um, I know there's time for questions afterwards, but it would be a bad thing for me to say a lot of words and having you understand just half of them. Um, then the last thing is that I think the two speakers we just had were pretty, I'd say, optimistic about the possibilities that there are for changing um, the law relating not just to human rights protection generally, but to remedies specifically. And my apologies, I'm going to be a bit more pessimistic than the past few speakers, as you might already infer from Seth Milton over here. Um, those of you who don't recognize him, watch Office Space. It's completely unrelated. So, <laughs> extraterritorial remedies. Um, I'm going to speak about a couple of things. First of all, why are we talking about extraterritorial remedies? Now, a couple of pre previous speakers have already uh, either explicitly or implicitly discussed this, so those very shortly. Um, I'll say a couple of things about the, what the guiding principles and John Rucker specifically have said about extraterritoriality, -ter especially under the third pillar. Um, and then I'll come to the, sort of the, the, the main point of my presentation, that's how states have currently picked up on the extraterritoriality problem, mainly in the national action plans. Um, I'll say some things about the case law developments, but I think those or as well have already been pointed to our previous speakers. Um, so then I'll end up with, so what's ahead? Where's the, where the, where, where's the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak? So why extraterritorial remedies? Um, very shortly, you've already heard about how um, the separation of corporate legal personalities means that regulating from a home state perspective and finding uh, or sorry, find, yeah, regulating from a home state's perspective um, is a bit of a complicated problem. And finding remedies at a local level can be equally complicated, either because there is no court available or because there's no legal representation available, there's no legal funding, um, there might be very strong evidentiary problems, it might be a conflict region specifically, any awards that one might receive might not be enforced by local governments. There's all kinds of reasons why, in specific circumstances, finding a remedy as a victim of a business-related human rights violation is hard or next to impossible locally. And like I said, the separation of corporate legal personality um, means that this is not just this is not a simple issue. Um, there are criminal law possibilities for um, prosecuting corporations for violations they've committed abroad, but um, whether or not they really provide an opportunity for victims to actually find their own remedies very much depends on the legal system. Some European legal systems do allow victims to join in a criminal procedure, some don't. Um, other systems do it to a very uh, limited degree, uh, yet other systems make it very easy for victims to file their own criminal complaints, a pretty diverse area. Um, I'm not really going to discuss that in the rest of the um, presentation. I'm really going to talk, to talk about how you can find civil remedies extraterritorially. So basically the foreign direct liability cases that Lisbeth Anneking talked about this morning. Um, and this is specific, specifically a problem when we're talking about human rights violations in conflict areas. And as the quote over there suggests, uh, already early in the drafting process of the guiding principles, SRG Ruggi sort of realized or emphasized this point. And as you'll see later on, I find it pretty interesting that he's been uh, quite outspoken um, about the extraterritoriality issue early on in the drafting process, specifically to conflict areas. Well, as you can see, uh, what message should we send? Good luck. But then, as we'll see later on, not much of that message has gone through in the guiding principles themselves. And we were talking about Shell this morning and the separation of corporate legal personalities. This is what it actually looks like. Sorry, I, 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 I know. It's, uh, okay, let me just shortly explain. Um, each one of these brackets, each one of these little boxes is a separate legal person, it's a separate company. So we have the parent corporation abroad here. There's a holding company, another holding company with very specific 
holding company below it. And now here we come to the service companies and the local subsidiaries that actually commit the operations and so possibly commit the human rights violations. This is what the separation looks like. And keep in mind that each of these specific um, or companies, each of these boxes, is domiciled in another territory. They're incorporated somewhere else. Some for tax reasons, um, some for because it's the local place of operation, uh, and a parent company usually in a place where the company started and where they have most of their roots. And I'm just showing you this to sort of give you a very, very visible example of what extraterritoriality looks like. And I could, I could also take a picture of uh, where I draw these brackets all over the world. But you can see how, how hard it is for a victim to sort of retrace that corporate relationship back all the way back to the parent company and the home state of that parent company. So just shortly on the guiding principles and remedies, the third pillar. As you can see from um, GP25, providing remedies and ensuring that remedies take place is actually, in essence, a state obligation. Yes, this, uh, the guiding principles do talk about non-judicial remedies. Yes, there's a large discussion of corporate-based grievance mechanisms, but if you look at GP25, the foundational principle, and GP26, the second foundational principle, it's squarely a state obligation. Keep that in mind when we're going to the national action plans. Um, it's very much, very much uh, related to the state's obligation to protect against human rights abuses, and it's pretty much part and parcel of human rights law for the past two, three decades. Um, and the main obligation that states then have is to reduce practical, legal, and other relevant barriers, pretty open-ended, that could lead to a denial of access to remedy. So state obligation to make sure, in general, that remedies take place. The, thing, the, the one thing that guiding principles don't say explicitly is whether we're talking about host state remedies, so whether it's only on that obligation is only on the state where the, remedy, where the actual violation takes place, or whether it also could theoretically incur, obligation or in incur obligations on the home state of that multinational. So again, whether a violation happening here would also mean obligations for the state here. Now, extraterritoriality does feature in the comments to the principle. So, below the principle, principles themselves. And um, very specifically, it's one where uh, claimants actually face a denial of justice, where that's, that's when such a barrier, we talk about GP26, occurs. Or um, states should also look at the way that legal responsibility is attributed to members of the corporate group under domestic criminal and civil law and so on and so on and so forth. This is basically what we've, what we've been discussing today. But this does not necessarily amount to an obligation on home states. It's a concern that might be generally discussed and that home states might generally have to look at. But it doesn't move ba basically beyond um, what's already in the text of, of Guardian Principle 26. And what we then see is basically a jurisdictional debate where we're basically in the space between the point where um, jurisdiction under human rights law ends, where it ends, where the obligation on the home state, on, on states to do something extraterritorial, extraterritorially ends, and the discussion of how far can a home state go until it reaches its jurisdictional boundaries under public international law begins. That sort of jurisdictional no man's land. And the guiding principles are pretty silent on that. And you'd expect then the states to sort of pick up that, um, you could say, assignment, that encouragement that you can find in the, uh, in the commentary. Now, part of my research, I've been looking at the national action plans. And well, again, as you can see from the most interesting man in the world, it is pretty abysmal. Um, generally, remedies um, only take a small part of the national action plans that have currently been published. Um, even before I go there, Let's be aware that even though we tend to speak of the guiding principles as being universally adopted, universally supported um, through the UN Human Rights Council, only one national action plan has currently been published that's not from a European state. Only two, including that one, the Colombian guiding, uh, national action plan, are from non-EU states. 
So to what extent we're talking about a universal movement and a universal discussion is already, I think, quite debatable. Um, but even in those action plans, attention for, to remedies is pretty limited. And where there is talk of remedies, it's very much about non-judicial remedies. If you look at the Danish National Action Plan, there's a lot of talk about the Ombudsman. There's a lot of talk about the OECD National Action Plan. If you talk, take the Dutch National Action Plan, um, even though they do discuss issues un, uh, under the guise of state-based state judicial remedies, all the action points are on non-state-based corporate grievance mechanisms. All of them. Same thing goes for the, for the UK National Action Plans. Ex, um, attention for state-based remedies is extremely limited. Um, where there is concrete um, attention to state-based judicial remedies, um, there's a couple of things that stand out. Uh, first of all, most action plans give some attention to the costs of finding a procedure in, uh, in that specific state. And we've heard about litigation costs, again, finding uh, legal aid, finding uh, legal representation, cost of actually filing the claim, cost of paying your lawyer, and so on. But if you look at the actions that are then proposed, um, almost every national action plan suffices with either just mentioning that it's costly and then not discussing it at all. The Dutch national action plan even specifically says, well, we think our legal aid is pretty much sufficient. And it's too bad that there's no a representat representative of, of the legal profession here today because they would probably tell you it is not sufficient. Um, otherwise, the commitments are very general in reviewing the civil procedure. Again, as heard this morning, civil procedure is pretty, a pretty complex, complicated set of issues as they pertain to business human rights. So just a general commitment to review, I think, is pretty insufficient. And as far as extraterritoriality goes, um, we see that some of the national action plans, so the, the Dutch one, the UK, and the Danish one, do discuss uh, extraterritoriality. But the UK national action plan basically leaves it in that jurisdictional no man's land, basically saying, well, we don't think there is an obligation under human rights law to act, act extraterritorially, but state, states might choose to do so, period. No position, no commitment, no action. The Dutch national action plan goes even further, or even further back, depending on how you see it, saying that, well, we, uh, the Dutch government does not believe that extraterritorial action should be taking place. It should not be a general instrument pertaining to extraterritorial action um, and basically leaves it at that. So that, oh sorry, let me go back just one more uh, point. If you look at the Danish National Action Plan, um, for those of you who are familiar, the interesting thing is that it was drafted by the Danish Institute of, uh, of Human Rights which means, and then adopted by the Danish government. Now, I'm not a complete expert on, on what the specific procedure was, but you can basically see that the, the plan is sort of hinging on two, um, sort of two points. Sometimes it talks about the recommendations by the Danish Institute, which do include the recommendation to adopt, one, unilateral extraterritorial measures, and two, um, start negotiations for a multilateral instrument that would include extraterritorial measures, but if you see to what extent the government has adopted that recommendation, that's completely absent. So it's sort of, again, pretty much in limbo. So, um, again, I'll do this very shortly because I think we've talked about this pretty extensively already. Um, there's an in increase in uh, civil cases that sort of try to find their way around that current status quo where states don't really act on the extraterritoriality issues. And I'd like to sort of pinpoint two, um, one, your probably extremely familiar with already, especially if you've been to these, these sessions before, is the um, Nigerian case in the Netherlands, the Akpan and Milieu Defensie versus Shell case. Um, and just to reiterate, the jurisdictional foundation of that case was um, jointly finding the case against the subsidiary. So again, think about the boxes, the one on the bottom and the one on the top, arguing that factually they consider, concerned the same set of circumstances. Um, and then asking the Dutch court to assume jurisdiction over the subsidiary, even though it was domiciled in Nigeria, because the cases were so closely connected. And the interesting thing is that even though the Dutch court did consider and eventually um, dismissed the case against the parent company, because there was no general duty of care for the parent company, they, did st they could still retain jurisdiction over the subsidiary. Now, whether or not this could be possible in other, other European states is pretty, pretty open. 
but it might be a possibility. Second case, which is interesting, very new one, um, is but already mentioned, the common law case, which is an employment case of, of Gabonese workers that were dismissed by a mining company 20 years ago, uh, in their perspective unfairly, where the French court assumed jurisdiction not because, as the workers claimed, the French holding company was a co-employer, but because, because um, if the case couldn't go forward in France, that would amount to denial of justice. And the connection um, between the Gabonese employer, or employing company, Gabonese subsidiary, and the French holding company was found in just that small share at the time of filing. Again, I think pretty creative way to, I hate this thing, pretty creative way to go around uh, the issue. And as we'll see, I think in the future is that in absence of state action, litigants will try to find different ways, different jurisdictional possibilities uh, of going around the extraterritoriality issue, finding, let's say, in some cases even artif pretty artificial constructions um, to get their case to be uh, heard in the European court. Um, some of the cases you can find actually in the handbook. Uh, the, the factual uh, summary is already there. There's a Swedish case uh, on dumping in Chile. There's a German case where actually German court, court did just assume jurisdiction over a Pakistani factory fire. And interestingly enough, a new case in the Netherlands filed against Trafigura over the Probo Koala disaster. And I think if, you, uh, if you're interested in the issue of access to remedy, if you're interested in extraterritoriality, this is basically where I think the main uh, developments are going to come from. Um, and what we see in these cases is also that there's an increased involvement of NGOs. I was talking about legal funding being a very um, problematic issue and the lack of state action at that point. NGOs have started to fill that gap even trying to crowdfund, as it happens in the Netherlands, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of cases in absence of actual legal aid um, and supporting practically plaintiffs, uh, victims, local victims, that try to, uh, try to bring these cases. Um, there is there's definitely some state action happening in the business human rights area in general. We, we have talked about the French um, law or in Amsterdam, but be aware that these do not really directly improve access to remedy. The rules that they set and the, and the possibility for finding complaints might help eventually victims um, to find their own personal remedy, but thus far there's no direct increase in these laws. Um, let's get the rest of that part. The last thing, I, I was, to be honest, very disappointed to hear the representative of the EU uh, or of the European Parliament talk about how some of the um, recommendations were killed off in committee. Because, and I'll do this from the bottom up, um, the Council of Europe recently uh, adopted a recommendation that basically says verbatim what he was discussing in regard to the European Parliament. First of all, it calls upon all member states of the Council of Europe, and be aware, every member of the EU is still a member of the Council of Europe, not the other way around, calls upon the member states to uh, apply legislative or other measures that might be necessary to ensure human rights abuses um, by business enterprises to give rise to civil liability. And they do specific recommendations as well. Um, how does you do that? One, form of necessity. Two, asset-based jurisdiction. Three, uh, rejection of form non-convenience. Pretty much everything that was also in the uh, European Parliament set of recommendations, and I think also pretty much um, what the report of, uh, of today is arguing for. Um, and another interesting development, I think, is that the committee um, on economic, social, and cultural rights has recently engaged with the debate on the NAPs, reviewing the United Kingdom's uh, national action plan and basically saying, well, uh, that's all fine and well, but we re we'd really like to see some action, um, especially regarding the legal liability of corporations domiciled on your territory. And they're um, not as super specific as the Council of Europe is, but you can see that from all kinds of, of international uh, organizations, pressure is mounting on states to actually um, go ahead with action rather than a national action plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, all three speakers, for your very insightful contributions. And also for sp sticking to the time, because we now have half an hour left for uh, discussion. 
so that's uh, very good. But also thank you for showing us how the recommendations coming out of this research project might actually find a way into your work and the many other ongoing developments at the national level, at the European level, and also at the global level at the United Nations. And it's encouraging to hear, not, notwithstanding the very welcome um, reality check by uh, Lucas, the, about the many avenues that, um, that are out there where these recommendations might actually contribute to further action, because it's clear that that is what is needed, uh, further action. Um, well, your contributions have, uh, well, I have several questions, but I don't want to abuse my position as a moderator. So I first would like to uh, give the opportunity to, pe to the people in the audience to raise uh, some questions. So are there any questions you have for any of our specific panelists or all three of them? Please, could you state your name and your affiliation? Hi, my name is Sandra Junko. I'm from the European Coalition for Corporate Justice. Um, an argument we've heard from several legislators regarding the removal of access to remedy and justice barriers are that, especially related to barriers uh, regarding financial barriers and burden of proof barriers, is that they would, removing these barriers through European law would come at too great of a cost for the European citizen. Uh, because then the state would have to either foot some of the costs through like legal aid, state-sponsored state, uh, legal aid, or uh, state-paid state inquiries into um, lifting the corporate veil. So they said it would be just too costly for the European Union and member states as well. Is this something you've encountered also? Is there any way around this argument? Thanks. Thank you, um, Daniel Augenstein again. I have two, um, two questions for Jonas that concern more the broader picture, the policy vision, if you wish. Um, I think there are two normative issues that are raised by the type of research we've been doing, or maybe that have been driven, driving the research. The first one is something I briefly mentioned this morning. Um, should cases that involve human rights violations enjoy somehow a particular status in the general system of private international law? Because we think that there's something particularly um, important about human rights to protect. Um, you can also phrase it in doctrinal terms, right? So the charter is part of EU primary law, arguably a constitution, part of the constitutional essentials of the EU, whereas Brussels I is just a regulation. So how do these two instruments interact? So that would be, call it the functional question. And then the other one is a territorial question. Um, is it the case that the EU should make the same efforts and apply the same standards when protecting human rights internally and externally? Right, so in our cases, if, it, if an EU company violates human rights, should it really matter whether the victim is on the territory of the Union or outside? because that's the crucial issue for human rights jurisdiction in terms of territory where the victim is. Now, again, the EU is uh, required by the treaties to uphold human rights in its external relations and has committed to upholding their universality. So the question is, it's a normative question, and why, or in what, to what extent should it matter where the victim is from the perspective of where EU policy is going? Thank you. Uh, just uh, an observation. Uh, the objection is always that uh, we should uh, improve and expand extraterritorial jurisdiction. But uh, I think we have also to ask ourselves to what extent a national jurisdiction could be stretched. Because otherwise, uh, the reactions like, like the ones of the US Supreme Court in Cuba would be, I think, highly... Uh, predictable, I think. So, to what extent the jurisdiction should be or could be uh, stretched and expanded 
since the jurisdiction remains national. So the taxpayers of a certain country pay for judgments and for the service. And this is the way, the other part of, the other side of this problem is, by the other side, to what extent an innovative, let me stress, or perhaps better say, an aggressive interpretation of uh, procedural rules took place many times in many countries. In my country, Italy, a very aggressive, uh, let's say, interpretation of law took place in many senses because of corruption. I am not uh, going to, into detail. So, to what extent it is necessary, or it is possible, or it is feasible to imagine to uh, give much more larger jurisdiction to the national courts, or to what extent I think one should rely also on an extensive and intelligent interpretation by, by, by the judges. And very last consideration, if you take the, the wording of the, of, the, of the judges in Kiobel, when they say, touch and concern the territory, but this is fantastic, because what touch and concern? It's once, once more, we need an interpretation. Another judge could say that a certain case touch and concerns because of the, I don't know, because of the incredible scandal of public opinion it, it, it created. I'm sorry. Who would like to um, react? Uh, Lucas first. Yeah. So um, let, me, let, me, let me just take up those two questions at the same time because I think they, they pertain to the same point to a certain extent. Um, first of all, I don't want to crum, come across as, as uh, a complete naive human rights idealist and go up about talking about how universal civil jurisdiction will save the day. That's the first point. Um, and if you hear some states t uh, talk about the cost barriers and the practical uh, problems that we might have if there is an increase in one jurisdiction or an increase in legal aid for these foreign cases, sometimes you get the impression that that's what we are all arguing for, sort of complete free-for-all. Um, and I'm not convinced by that, um, by that attitude. First of all, because if you look at the the aspect of costs, and I think you raised it as well, is taxpayer costs. If you look at the, the cases that have currently been filed, and I think we've seen um, a pretty um, great overview of m how that happened in most European countries. I think uh, we excluded a couple, but then we're still talking about a handful of cases. That's one, two, maybe maximum 10 cases per country. Now, these cases are com big and complicated, absolutely. But if you compare that to the amount of, let's say, let's say patent litigation cases, if you t uh, compare it to the amount of um, just general corporate liability cases that have nothing to do with human rights in general. Uh, I don't know, merger cases. Um, all, again, those are all taxpayer funded. I think human rights, business human rights cases are a small blip on, uh, small blip on the map. And having to increase your, your, legal bu your, your budget for uh, legal affairs just for those, ex those few extra cases that might come in. And I, to be honest, I don't see a wave of cases coming, to be very honest. Um, I don't think that's the major the major problem, um, and I also don't think don't think it's a genuine concern by most by most states. I think they're more concerned with protecting their own multinationals rather than their own national budget. Um, related to that, um, to what extent can you stretch up extraterritorial jurisdiction? Now, um, the reason I ended with these um, cases that are currently going on is that I think they also serve as a warning to states, because. Victims, NGOs, creative lawyers will find, uh, try and find ways to use existing procedural mechanisms to file, file these cases. And you were talking about the Alien Tort Statute. I mean, the Alien Tort Statute was never written or meant to be a human rights statute, let alone a business human rights vehicle. It was never meant to be that way. It was rediscovered and re-employed. Now, we don't know what the next ATS is going to be. Maybe not. Maybe nothing. Maybe there's nothing, com uh, nothing ever comparable. But there might be some statute or some rule that will be stretched up, abused, turned around in the future by civil litigants and maybe by uh, courts that are receptive to those complaints. And um, I actually think that being clear as a state on how far you will go jurisdictionally to let these cases come in, and also to take your responsibility for our hosting these parent corporations, because that's really what you're doing, um, might even curtail the amount, of case, uh, the amount of cases where, as an external observer, you could say, well, this might not actually touch and concern, to use that language, um, 
this specific form. Now, I personally have a, have a major problem with the touch and concern test and the Kielba case, but I won't go into that. Um, but let me end on this point. All these major uh, multinationals, and I'll just restrict myself to the ones that are genuinely connected to the territory of the home state where they're incorporated. Shell, for instance. They pay a lot of taxes. They bring in a lot of revenue. They bring in a lot of opportunities for the home state. And my question is, at what cost? And I think as a, as a home state, we absolutely have a responsibility to, to bear at least some of the costs that are now externalized and put in different states um, that, that we, we aren't currently paying, but we are reaping the profits. Thank you. Is that fine? Uh, thank you very much for, for intriguing questions. San Sandra, right? So if I could speak to that first, uh, don't think I can add much, but, uh, but of course, uh, as Lucas is saying, it's not uh, necessarily the full costs, it's not necessarily a, a flood of cases, uh, but, and you could also see it as a, you could address strategic cases and strategic litigation if you want, were concerned. It doesn't have to be that they're full support or a strong financial cost for, for every case, uh, uh, every conceivable case. You could also think about financial costs not being the only costs. If you think about the, the non-financial costs, you have another calculation, a slightly naive idea, but of course uh, very relevant if you take uh, human suffering or, or environmental uh, cost uh, uh, into the picture. And you could also see it as a addressing a systemic issue, so it's not necessarily that funding that case addresses that single one-off situation. With a bit of luck, a systemic issue is being addressed with that case, and you can see it as investing in a, in, in a shift that affects a, a set of legislation or, or a set of practices or, or a, a particular company or, or a way companies act, what have you. And maybe I also like the idea of, of crowd, crowdfunding for, for, uh, for litigation and, and of course that, that's not for the state typically to, to contribute to, but uh, that's of course a, a nice modern way of, of getting support. On Daniel's uh, questions there, I, I guess you, it was very, they were somewhat leading questions because you, I think you answered them for me. Uh, and and uh, there would of course be way, uh, arguments to say why human rights or fundamental rights shouldn't be uh, exclusive. There are other important values, uh, environment, uh, environmental uh, being one of them. But at the same time, as you say, there, are, there is the charter of constitutional status, there are the values of the European Union that, that uh, relate to the rule of law, to democracy, to human rights, to minority rights uh, uh, in, Article, in Article 2. Uh, and, and of course that gives uh, human rights a special status. In criminal justice, uh, in the area of criminal justice, uh, there are typically fundamental rights clauses in the EU instruments, but there are no uh, other exclusionary clauses like that. So you could, you could argue also there that there is some uh, special status for, for human rights, fundamental rights. On environmental issues, uh, we heard earlier today about the specific, uh, specific regime for that, and that of course relates uh, to the Aarhus or Aarhus Convention and the role of, of the European Union or the engagement of the European Union there. Uh, so that explains maybe historically why, why, why that has been dealt with in a separate way. Uh, but maybe human rights should have been, been uh, dealt with very similarly uh, uh, from very early on. Second question from Daniel there on, on the territorial aspects. So I, I would think for credibility reasons and for practical reasons there shouldn't be a difference. Of course you might have, you may have, uh, some much more significant human rights violations externally. Uh, but uh, as a principle there shouldn't be uh, too much of a difference. Uh, of course there are all kinds of practical, uh, practical things. Uh, so I, I, would, I would argue that. And also in the context of, uh, of the opinion that we will have to adopt with our mandate being exclusively within the Union, that's also an, an argument for at least that we, the, the, in our thinking and our, in our suggestion, that we, we say that they are the same. And then I come back to what I said before in my intervention and, and uh, earlier on, uh, the, the importance of, of a credible system that is uh, something that the constituency, that the people of the, of the European Union, that they, they can believe in the businesses, that they can believe in the European Union, that they are doing uh, 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 their utmost to, the, 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 uh, to, to make the European Union a credible and a, and a sort of a, a good place to be and something to be proud of. Uh, so maybe that's a, that's a final argument, again on the wishy-washy uh, uh, soft side, but, but maybe still worthwhile mentioning. Yes. No, no, 
other things. There's you can have both. <laughs> I think one is enough. Yeah, um, I, I want to address the question uh, my gentleman here in the first row. Uh, I think that's uh, a very good question, and also in relation to what uh, Lucas uh, um, reminded us uh, in, in his intervention, I think there are many difficulties, of course, in all this uh, debate and uh, on, on uh, any advocacy objective of expanding jurisdiction uh, of courts of, of, of any country. Uh, jurisdiction has traditionally be, been based on territory. And then uh, territory is the by default jurisdiction, and the other grounds of jurisdiction are always what, they call, what we call extraordinary. But this is what has historically been the, the, the rule, and I think uh, uh, the whole 20th century, and uh, now this century, 20, 21st, of increased globalization, in which we, we basically all the, the economic actors especially economic actors, but also civil society you know, is increasingly and more easily operating across the globe you know, with our respect basically for by frontiers and technology is making its part as well in, in facilitating all this uh, uh, cross-frontier, uh, cross-border uh, operations uh, has made it really unworkable that, uh, that rule. And I think we need to be creative to respond to the challenges of today. We need to be creative and also uh, uh, be ambitious and take the risk. Uh, if we're going to uh, wait until everything becomes clear and we have a perfect model of world order and legal order uh, and then we take action, no, and, and, and make, making you know, changes here and there and, and there, probably that will be too late and the planet will no longer exist <laughs> and, and we will go with it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Ah, sorry, just uh, just let me finish. Uh, uh, the uh, expansion of jurisdiction, uh, I mean, it's just one part of the of the of the, of the whole uh, puzzle, and I think uh, the the jurisdiction, the judiciaries of the, of developing countries or the countries where the abuses occur, had to play a role as well. They had to be efficient. They had to deal with the subsidiaries, and it is possible that uh, you know a, a coordinated. Uh, a set of changes will uh, finally achieve the final and the objective. The EU, in terms of jurisdiction, is nowhere close to the US. That is true <laughs> extraterritorial jurisdiction. And then they complain because the European Union uh, imposes a fine on, on Apple. But they do that all the time. All the banks from Barclays to HSB and uh, Paribas have been fined by US authorities in all, all, all those recent years without any hindrance, and uh, that's extraterritorial jurisdiction for true, and, uh, and, but the EU is nowhere close to that. So don't worry too much in expanding a little bit, just to get a little bit close to that, uh, but, uh, as, uh, we will never be risking too, too much. Uh, thank, you. thank you, I know there are more questions in the audience, so I would like to ask you to be as brief as possible, and in both answers and questions, so we have enough time. Uh, well, first you and then Lisbeth. Hello, uh, I'm Shikha Setia from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. Uh, and my question was to, the, to all of you, actually. I mean, we're developing these tools and talking about the modalities of these tools, but what are the strategies for actually bringing, I mean, giving these tools in the hands of the communities that uh, we're talking about as rights holders? How do you take it from this sort of discussion at the government level, at the policy level, at the academic level, to the communities that we're talking about? Lisbeth, and are there any are more questions? Anyone else that would like to address the panel? No? Okay, then Lisbeth. Thank you, yeah. Um, uh, I just would like to address and, and hear the opinions of the, of the people on the panel on two uh, ways forward that we didn't really discuss uh, today. These are not the ways forward, but I do think they uh, are, this is about two potential minimum thresholds, as you could call them. First is uh, the right to a fair trial as uh, incorporated in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, now, the European Convention on Human Rights um, the material provisions in the convention do not apply extraterritorially, extra but Article 6 is a procedural um, uh, provision and uh, would probably apply, has, so this is the, the right to fair trial, which also encompasses the right to access to court. 
Um, and that would probably also uh, be a right that plays a role in foreign direct liability cases, even if they pertain to uh, victims from outside the ECHR uh, member states, or if they apply to cases pertaining to um, uh, have wrongs um, committed outside the ECHR member states. Um, and um, the ECHR um, jurisprudence shows us that um, there are certain minimum thresholds when it comes to costs, and also when it comes to access to evidence. And interestingly, this has been raised in the Shell Nigeria case, it hasn't been taken very far in this case. Um, Heather, the plaintiffs basically said the fact that we have such difficulties in getting access to evidence on the basis of Dutch procedural rules um, is actually a violation of Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. I think this is interesting, especially in those cases where um, you really find that victims find themselves in a catch-22 situation of really not being able to get effective access to a court in uh, the EU member states, uh, and I would be interested to hear your opinions on that. Uh, another way, uh, or another um, way forward, or minimum threshold, I think, and is also something we haven't discussed today, uh, is in the field of criminal law. Um, as we found in our report for the Dutch government, um, actually Dutch law, we looked at the material rules of Dutch criminal law, has a lot of possibilities for holding uh, corporations criminally liable. There's already a lot of in, in the law that is in the books uh, that we can use to, to um, at least um, 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 hold liable those companies um, that, that are involved in the most serious violations, uh, have most serious human rights abuses. Um, and uh, my question would be, um, I have no idea how, about how this works in other countries, but I do suspect there is more, there's similar possibilities there. Um, what we find in the Netherlands is that there is a problem when it comes to enforcement, because again, that is costly. So there are possibilities, but public prosecutors will not take up these cases because they simply do not have the funds uh, or the capacity to do so uh, with their whole, uh, with, with their huge workload. So I would be interested to hear um, how this is, if you have any opinions on, on this or on the feasibility of, of this avenue and maybe also from Nicola I, I know there's this is also has to do with um, I think developments um, at the International Criminal Court um, so in the Netherlands for instance we have a task force that deals with serious international crimes because we have to have this task force because of the uh, statute of the International Criminal Court um, this statute does not um, um, uh, contain um, um, uh, the, the, the obligation to criminalize also corporate um, uh, corporations. And I was wondering if, if you know about any um, uh, developments in, in that area. That was just noting that down. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's first give uh, the panelists uh, the opportunity to react to both questions, and I will also uh, take the opportunity. Thank you. Shall I go first? Oh no, well, no, I don't, I don't actually think I should do that as a moderator, but okay, thank you, I will. Um, I have several questions I'd like to ask the panel, but I'm going to react to, to Lisbeth concerning the issue of criminal law, because indeed, um, I've read a very interesting uh, 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 research done by Lisbeth, uh, coordinated by Lisbeth, and it's really worth reading it, uh, because it shows what's going on. There's so much actually going on, and it does show that there are opportunities in criminal law. Um, I don't think there is any uh, serious debate at the moment about extending uh, the jurisdiction of the ICC beyond uh, the possibility of holding individuals uh, uh, accountable for, for international crimes. Of course, it has been uh, proposed in the past when there were the negotiations on the ICC. There was a serious proposal on the table to extend the mandate or the jurisdiction of the ICC to include legal persons. Um, and it, w it wasn't adopted, I think, for many political reasons. But also, uh, one of the the reasons brought forward was also the fact that it's not possible within every national jurisdiction to hold legal entities to account. So it's still a very diverse, uh, scattered landscape. So I don't think anytime soon that's going to happen. It's, I'm sure it's going to pop up in the uh, negotiations, uh, the deliberations on towards an international treaty. But I think we all know that at least. Uh, well, at the very least, from a political perspective, we're very far removed from some, anything like that coming into, uh, uh, into being anytime soon. I'm going to give you the opportunity to react also to what was said. Okay, Do you, would someone like to react to the questions concerning how we're actually going to bring all of this down back to the people on the ground, to the rights holders? Um, or the uh, issues mentioned uh, also by Lisbeth 
uh, concerning these uh, minimum thresholds, also the applicability of Article 6 of the European Convention once these cases actually uh, take place within the European uh, legal space. I think uh, I'm particularly interested on, the, on your question uh, on, on, on criminal law, the possibility, the potential of criminal law. Uh, I think there are interesting developments there. Uh, everybody knows that uh, the, there are amendments to the, Afri the charter or the statute of the African Court of Human Rights uh, granting the, in the African Court uh, criminal jurisdiction on, on corporate crimes, a series of corporate crimes. I don't think that the uh, statute is, uh, is in force yet. Uh, um, probably will never be. <laughs> and even if it's enforced, uh, if, uh, the level of implementation in the African continent is quite, uh, um, you know, the l limited, uh, but, uh, but it's still is an interesting development. And that, me, that shows that there is some uh, interest and willingness there. There are debates also in, the, in that regard that there is a growing expansion of criminal or, 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 the, or the acceptance that, uh, of corporate uh, criminal liability in many jurisdictions in the, in the South, that, that was, wasn't the case. And that's especially thanks to the push from the OECD and the anti-bribery convention machinery. They're putting pressure <laughs> on many countries to implement those changes. And I think that shows more or less the leader where to go, no? which way to go. These changes are possible in that avenue. Well, why changes shouldn't be possible in this other avenue as well? I think uh, it is quite feasible. Um, uh, uh, and finally, the last thing is that um, I probably made a mistake of uh, uh, overemphasizing the issue of jurisdiction. I just wanted to, in my presentation, highlight that issue that I found that particularly relevant, but it's not the only issue. And of course, expansion of jurisdiction is not everything. <laughs> it's just one element. But you, uh, in relation to uh, criminal investigations, prosecution, and uh, including you know, implementation, recognition, execution of sentences in civil and commercial matters, cooperation, legal, mutual legal assistance is, is crucial. And that's also been a part of the recommendations of the OECHR report and guidelines, and it's also in the Council of Europe report and, and many other things. No? Mutual legal assistance, cooperation between the judiciary, the police, and the other authorities is, is crucial in, in all this. So uh, I think any legal framework that we may create in the future has to have a crucial, a very important chunk on, on cooperation across jurisdictions. Thanks. You have your own, I think. I have my own. <laughs> so maybe I could uh, try to say something. Uh, it would be very simple to Shika Sesa. Uh, so I think uh, there could, of course, be a number of, of things one could do. But uh, I referred to earlier to the, to the problem with, of, of awareness and that, uh, that you, you have to know where to turn, uh, basically. And of course, coming back to what I, what I also alluded to about uh, comparative advantage for the uh, of the European Union of, of more uniformity of having uh, one system or one minimum standard or, or a clarity on what the responsibility is that brings awareness at the, at a at the level that is not achieved by having uh, 28 systems or, or, or more. So of course that's uh, that's uh, something that is related to to spreading the tools as you as you phrased it. Um. Yeah, let me first let me start there as well. I find this actually a harder question uh, to answer uh, than I thought it would be, because um, that might have to do with the fact that I'm just like the ivory tower academic working from my desk. That might be part of it. Um, but the point, the problem is, I think that on the one hand, um, I'm not so sure whether, let's say, handing out leaflets and say you can have your case in the Netherlands will really uh, be very beneficial. Um, on the other hand, it would be very easy to say, well, yeah, just let the NGOs handle it and tell them where to, where to go. So, um, so and, and some, the answer is to be very, very cowardly somewhere in the middle. So you could think of um, including uh, the possibility of national procedures in the, the consultations with the OECD contact points. You could think of um, talking about including this when you're uh, setting standards for, uh, let's say, non-judicial grievance me mechanisms, just, just to sort of um, have this extra line in there saying, hey, okay, but if you're not satisfied with this, these are your judicial possibilities. Local first, but it might be hypothetically possible to go in there and there. And I think like a, a handbook like this, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, that is a small step towards, towards that. Um, and whether or not just really sort of advertise that 
I don't know. I don't know. I mean, one of the problems which we generally don't tend to discuss here is the question of how these cases actually get to um, the forum where they're at. And usually there's either an NGO involved or very specifically a lawyer's office that sees a, an economic opportunity in pursuing these cases. And that might be just as well just out of, out of, out of um, let's say, political motivation or a genuine belief in human rights. I mean, I don't doubt that. But if you see which lawyers have filed these cases, it's not the general uh, civil law population, a very specialized offices that file such cases. And it will go actively looking for them and contacting NGOs and um, basically building a business practice on this. Now, whether or not it's a good thing, I'll leave it completely open. But it is the way in which in which it currently is happening. It might be the way in which it is increasing. And then that point, um, I, like as you very well know, I don't know much about criminal law generally. The only thing I want to say about that is um, it might also help if prosecutors, again, um, we'll also have the courage to look extraterritorially and see what the possibilities are. Those will be those cases will be very hard for evidentiary reasons, uh, limit limitation of enforcement jurisdiction, and so on. So major, huge amount of barriers. But let's let's think about the Trafigura case. You included it in your presentation as an extra, as a business human rights extraterritorial case. I actually disagree. I don't think it's an extraterritorial case. Um, in this case, um, th does prosecutor only prosecuted the export? of the dangerous substances from the Amsterdam, from the Amsterdam port uh, without a license for that specific stuff. That's the only thing that, was, that, was, um, that, that this case was about. And of course, in the background, there are all these thousands of victims uh, in the Ivory Coast, but they could not join the procedure because it wasn't about their uh, specific harm. They didn't join the procedure. There was little, no communication. Only afterwards that the, the uh, British civil case contact the, uh, the Dutch prosecutor and say, hey, that evidence you feel, can we use it? Um, and it was mainly, not just against our figura, but at, uh, also against the Amsterdam Port Authority and the municipality of Amsterdam, just about could we leave this, let this stuff leave the harbor. But that isn't necessarily the violation that, that's at the root of it. And even though there were convictions, and we have already heard they were sort of alleviated uh, a bit, I don't think that would be a remotely satisfying for victims. So they have to address these cases. These cases would have to address the actual on the ground violation that specifically harmed the victims, not just whatever you can uh, get your hands on. Last point on the um, European court. Um, on one hand, I don't think the court will ever go as far as saying that Article 6 requires states to extend the jurisdiction laws. I don't, I don't think so. Um, both for, I think, very good legal reasons. I don't think Article 6, even as a procedural right, goes that far. But also, um, that, that would be political suicide, basically. They won't, go, they won't do that. They would never do that. But on the point of equality of arms, evidentiary issues, I think that's, that's where the major battles still has to be fought. I don't think local courts will um, do that. But if that ever comes up to the European Court of Human Rights, I'm gonna see, I think we're going to see a very, very interesting case. Just one very final thought, because we've run out of time, I'm very much aware. Thank you for raising the issue of how we're going to bring all this down to back to the rights holders, because I think it's crucial. And I would just like to point out the importance of information here. Uh, lack of information on where to go, where to turn, but also lack of information on corporate structures. It's, it's actually absolutely vital. Uh, it played an important, an enormous decisive role in the sh ongoing shell litigation at the, in the Netherlands. This lack of information, which leads to an, an inequality of arms. So in the field of the environment, uh, you pointed it out, we have the Aarhus, Aarhus Convention, which is all about participation and providing information. So I think this is some, an area that needs a lot of attention uh, when we move forward on these issues. Okay, that uh, being said, I would ask you, to, I'd like to invite you to thank our panelists for their most insightful presentations. So we've reached our final segment 
of the final conference. My thanks to all uh, watching us live via streaming, all of you here for your patience, uh, your questions, your interest. Um, to end our day today, uh, we have a special guest with us who will share her closing, uh, concluding remarks to send us off and hopefully with a lot of thought and reflection moving forward. Uh, so uh, I would uh, just briefly like to introduce Heidi Autala, previously the Minister for International Development and State Ownership Steering in Finland uh, from 2011 to 2013. She is currently working her third legislature as a member in the European Parliament in the Greens EFA group. Uh, she has complemented her extensive political career at the national and the European level with other professional activities and various voluntary work commitments related mostly to human rights. Heidi, now Vice President of the Greens EFA Group, previously chaired the Subcommittee on Human Rights. In addition, she is the co-chair of the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly and the European Parliament Working Group on Reproductive Health, HIV, AIDS, and Development. So thank you, and thank you all. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to, to understand that there's such a group of distinguished lawyers and other experts dealing with the, the particularly with the issue of access to remedy in uh, business and human rights uh, area. Um, and as a policymaker, I would like to perhaps give you a picture that I, as, as I des describe it at the moment, where are our chances to, to promote responsible business conduct. And uh, I think we can do a lot. I heard from my legal advisor, Heike, who is sitting here in the back of the room, who has been following your discussions, that, uh, that uh, Mrs. Yannibas has described that working with business and human rights is like watching the grass grow. You just need to sow the seeds and watch, it's, it's some, and watch sometimes what happens. Uh, I'm an agronomist by training, so I like this very much. But I think at the moment we can do very much. We, we really can fertilize these seeds that we have sowed because um, in this globalized world, indeed, I think there's, there's one particular, um, let's say, um, backlash that has um, faced, uh, let's say, the, the, those who want to promote free trade in the world, that people are simply not anymore buying that. Uh, I would say there's two elements uh, which are sometimes quite different from each other. There is this kind of real protectionist, nationalist element that no, enough is enough. But then there is this, uh, I would say, perhaps more informed uh, element in the criticism, which is that um, we see that um, uh, companies um, um, and their business operations and sub supply chains, as they are so international uh, today, that uh, they are not responsible and that they are creating problems. They may be uh, adding to GDPs, they may be helping developing countries to, to, to expand their, their export sectors, uh, but that we see a lot of, uh, I would say, very unpleasant side effects, and that's why uh, the whole discussion on responsible business conduct is so important. Um, also, and um, I believe that um, we have many uh, concrete issues that can be uh, uh, conducive to, to the ideas that you have been developing in this project. Um, and I would not only speak about the uh, um, access to remedy issue, which is important. It is the, let's say, the missing third pillar of the RAGI uh, framework. Um, but also a little bit about the sort of beginning of the chain where, where problems are created and how we can prevent them. Um, uh, indeed, um, uh, if we look at the, the implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, we can see that uh, they are a very effic effective, efficient uh, instrument. Uh, we'd like to see more and more of national action plans. Now I understand that by far most of the EU member states have either an accepted one or one under, in the making. Uh, and this has to be ensured that it will be uh, carried out. Um, I belong to those who are slightly skeptical of, uh, of this idea of, um, of having one binding instrument at global level on, on business and human rights, which is the so-called Ecuador Initiative, um, because I see the risk that it will maybe uh, 
uh, also damage the implementation of the RAGI principle. So I'd rather see uh, that this process is, uh, is going on. And if, uh, if the Ecuador initiative, uh, if, uh, if it doesn't damage this problem, the, this implementation, but rather uh, complements it and brings it to, to further, then, then why not? Um, uh, in the European Parliament's uh, uh, Legal Affairs Committee, I took the initiative to, to start to, to, to deal with the issue of, uh, of uh, access to remedy. Uh, we had a hearing where we invited uh, uh, the, the, the persons from the uh, High Commissioner's Office from, uh, from uh, Geneva to explain to us what was going on in this project just before the Human Rights Council adopted the report. Uh, this summer, and um, I'm um, convinced that we will continue to work on that together with other relevant uh, parliamentary committees. And where I see uh, uh, the greatest opportunity now is, is the, the forthcoming uh, uh, action plan on responsible business conduct that we are all eagerly waiting from the European Commission. Uh, it's a pity that it didn't come during the Dutch presidency, because the Dutch presidency would have been the absolutely ideal one to take it on. Uh, it's, it maybe deserves to be mentioned that um, uh, when the Dutch presidency opened their, their term, even just before January, they, they organized an international conference on this topic in Amsterdam, uh, which uh, created a lot of good ideas and, and, and strengthened networks across all stakeholders. Uh, but um, I've been told uh, before the summer recess that um, we can expect this uh, communication to, to come uh, from the Commission uh, towards the end of the year. And I am one of those MEPs who would like to see that it gets a very thorough treatment uh, because it touches so many aspects. And it also, in, in our parliamentary world, uh, it, um, it has aspects um, touching so many uh, different parliamentary committees from employment to environment to human rights, foreign affairs, uh, international trade, uh, legal affairs, uh, and so on. And that could be a, a great opportunity also to interact with, uh, with uh, lawyers, with uh, researchers, with other stakeholders, uh, civil society, to see how we can best boost the whole um, whole um, framework on business and human rights, and very importantly, the, the access to remedy issue. Uh, but indeed, I, I wanted to touch a little bit um, uh, the, the beginning of this long chain that sometimes lead into violations of human rights and uh, the need on access to remedy, which you have uh, so successfully uh, discussed uh, in your project and today. Um, I believe that um, there must indeed be a remedy in place when one is needed, but uh, we should also treat uh, and prevent the cause of, of such, a, such a need of a remedy. And that's why we need uh, uh, corporate accountability and other responsibility legislation and policies that prevent human rights violations from happening in the first place. Um, I've uh, been told that many of, uh, of the distinguished speakers today have also discussed um, measures that not only would help the access to justice, but could also prevent violations. So the whole chain has been in your discussion. Um, and what, what could be done? Um, let me mention that the, the notion of policy coherence for development has gained a lot of uh, support and, and has become at least in at the level of, uh, of uh, words and ideas, uh, a, a very important tool. Now we may rather talk about policy coherence for sustainable development after we have uh, the so-called UN Agenda 2030, which is the implementation of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals with so many uh, sub-targets, and, and which is a, a very comprehensive uh, global uh, uh, program. So. Um, uh, I think uh, what has to permeate all actions is this understanding that we have to integrate, uh, that we have to see uh, at the same time how we can solve and uh, address uh, uh, different problems from human rights to environmental degradation to, to poverty eradication, which still has to be the, the, the uh, basis for development cooperation. Now, member states and the EU itself could establish uh, uh, better disclosure obligations. Uh, some have already been put in place, uh, but those are evidently um, important in gathering evidence and information about alleged violations. 
and uh, just the existing of this kind of legal tool, uh, I'm talking about disclosure obligations, would make the companies to take their accountability obligations much more seriously. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I also know that in many cases it is very difficult to establish the link between the foreign subsidiary and the parent company. So the idea to legally presume that the parent company controls its subsidiarity is worth considering, because in practice that is often the case. Uh, but the idea that I like most is the statutory duty to conduct human rights due diligence. And here, I think um, a very encouraging sign is that eight EU member states uh, are supporting the, or maybe together with France, are supporting the initiative of France to introduce uh, mandatory human rights due diligence obligations. Uh, many of you may have followed the initiative, uh, and it hasn't been very smooth, because um, there have been many questions about what sanctions, uh, civil uh, law or criminal law, and if I understand the present state, state um, the idea of having uh, criminal sanctions has been a bit too radical at this time. But um, I listened with, with um, uh, big ears your recent discussion on, on this uh, sort of where would be the right forum and, and should it be criminal uh, sanctions or, or what. Now, um, let's see that um, uh, maybe uh, the French initiative could actually be projected to the European level. I think it's a realistic idea that uh, there could be a, an EU-based legal instrument which would uh, uh, oblige uh, enterprises, uh, whether parent or subsidiary, um, to, to perform uh, their uh, human rights due diligence uh, process uh, properly. Um, and uh, then, of course, the discussion would arise that if there would be a European Union instrument, so where would be which which forum for for access to remedy? If access to remedy would be would be a part of that initiative, which is is not uh, at at the moment, um, to my knowledge, the case. But we could somehow uh, refine and uh, and uh, expand and develop further the French initiative and see what what new ideas it would bring to to our EU level discussions. Um, but um, I don't think we only need mandatory legislation. Uh, I also have seen many times that soft law instruments and uh, voluntary initiatives actually uh, are a good start for something that sometimes later becomes mandatory. So uh, in the European Parliament, we, we maybe have a little bit too much this kind of uh, ideological type of discussion on whether corporate social responsibility has to be voluntary or mandatory. I think it can be both. And sometimes, indeed, there is a sort of chain of events that a good uh, voluntary event measure becomes uh, mandatory, uh, especially because then companies start to realize that actually uh, it's not good for the, for the f f exemplary and forerunner companies to suffer from those who are the free riders. So I think we, we can have a very dynamic approach to the, to the instruments. Um, then uh, should we perhaps look at the model of uh, the safeguards of, and other policy frameworks of international financing institutions, such as the World Bank and European Investment Bank? Maybe that could help uh, in, um, in guiding uh, the companies at the sort of policy level, uh, with the policy level uh, measure to to, to see what kind of uh, uh, um, elements there should be in the proper due diligence uh, analysis. And, 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 uh, uh, and thus, uh, we would help the companies to understand what has to be done in order to, to prevent uh, further uh, violations and, and um, failures. Um, I have been following closely some um, specific cases where even the, with the best intentions, uh, companies, uh, or in this case, uh, development financing institutions fail to do their due diligence uh, 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 studies. Um, I, I may mention a case where the Dutch and the Finnish uh, development financing institutions got into quite a big trouble in Honduras, because um, uh, there was um, uh, a um, hydropower project called Aguacarca, uh, which um, also um, 
was going to be uh, built on a land of indigenous people. And uh, not, not um, everyone um, at, at the local level agreed that this project should take place. It's not, it's not a mega project, but nevertheless, uh, the, the uh, contradictions at local level were so hard that there were murder cases. And uh, there's a very well-known case of Berta Caceres, who was one of the victim, the main victim of this case. So uh, how can it happen that even a companies or financing institutions who have the best intentions of the, in the world to, to, to do something good, to, to make our planet a better place, can fail. So I think there is really a case to see how, how um, such organizations and companies, of course, could be guided to, to make sure that uh, they, they don't fail in their due diligence. Um, finally, a word about um, openness and transparency. Um, in this discussion on voluntary measures versus um, uh, mandatory uh, binding measures. Uh, I think uh, a kind of a middle way is, um, is, is, is through openness and transparency. Uh, many times we have seen that uh, the fact that, um, that companies have uh, started to, to look and, and disclose their practices uh, to the public, uh, to the governments, uh, to their investors um, in a proper way has also uh, helped to improve uh, their practices. So that's why I would very much like to see that, um, that transparency goes along with all the measures that, that uh, will be put in place. So uh, we're dealing with uh, such a truly global and broad phenomenon and um, the, the responsible business conduct is so important for meeting the global challenges that we really uh, have to work together very hard. And uh, there are several of us in the European Parliament who would be very happy to continue to interact with yourselves when the moment comes. So thank you very much. Thank you for, for those thoughts. It, it leaves us, I think, with a bit of optimism moving forward. There are policymakers who have these issues at heart and are looking to push these issues forward. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, it's been, as we've mentioned, years of hard work to get to this point. Uh, you've All those who have registered online and those of you here, you'll be receiving uh, a sort of a notification. We have the videos and podcasts up of today's events, and then later on when the ebook is available online as well for your download. Thank you so much. All the best, and we invite you to continue working in this passionate area to make some change. Thank you all. <laughs>